All right, trading in two former Irish greats for another pair of Irish legends. They're celebrating a milestone this weekend. 55 years ago, the Fighting Irish won the 1966 National Championship under coach Ara Farsegian. Please help me welcome that team center, George Gedeke from the class of 67 and from the class of 69, quarterback Terry Hanratty. Hello, everyone. Seems like only 65 years ago. <laughs> Hello. Now, guys, of course, the first thing everyone thinks about when they think about that 66 team is the game of the century. Can you keep a straight face by looking no, at that? No, I, I, I love it. I was going to save it, and we were just going to ignore it. But if, do you want to answer why you're, why you're wearing the clown nose? Yeah, I'm trying to hide all the blusted, busted blood vessels in my nose. I'm not. So that's it. That's simple. I went over big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, 66, everyone thinks of the 10-10 the tie against Michigan State, the game of the century. We're going to start with the big one. What are you guys' memories of, the, of that game and, and that season? Well, the memories are we had a – great football team in 1966 and we had a great football team in 1965 and all those guys came back for 66 the, there was only two question marks for myself and Jim Seymour I mean we had not taken a snap at Notre Dame they had no clue what we could do but you know Jim and I sort of took that as a, a little bit of a challenge and I, I remember telling him before the game I said listen we're the only people the two people that anybody's worried about Let's just go out and have some fun today. That's all you can do. My, you know, my whole philosophy in life is the harder you practice, the better you play, either on Saturday or Sunday. And, uh, and it turned out pretty well. And uh, it, was, it was a fun, phenomenal team. You know, I got guys like George who were protecting me, and we had All-Americans on the offensive line. You know, I could have had a ham sandwich in my back pocket, and somewhere along the line I could have eaten it when these guys protected me. But it was a lot of fun, a great team. Yeah, uh, the, the thing, I, I'm a Michigan guy. And uh, we took the train up from South Bend into Michigan. The minute we got into Michigan, uh, you know, we saw Bubba for Pope, uh, you know, different signs like that at the different stations along the way with the railroad, okay? And uh, we got on, uh, on the campus there, and Bubba had a big old white Riviera parked right by the stadium with Bubba sitting on the side of the, uh, side of the car. He had it inscribed there, of course. But... It, it, I tell you what, it was, uh, I normally got butterflies like on a Friday night, maybe Thursday. I had butterflies on Monday that week, knowing we were playing Michigan State. And uh, it, it was a very intense ball game. There was no question about it. And uh, both teams, it was the hardest hitting game I ever played in. And I played seven years in the pros till I blew my knee out. But it was the hardest hitting game that I ever played in with Bubba Smith and Charlie Thornhill, George Webster, those guys on defense. But one final word on that. Nick fell off the train, re-injured his shoulder. Terry got out in the first quarter. I was out in the first quarter. So we missed center quarterback and tailback. That's like your catcher, pitcher, and center fielder in baseball. We came back from 10 nothing to tie 10-10. And they dubbed Arrow with going for the tie. Well, I'll tell you, Duffy Doherty went for the tie. He had the football with a minute and 30 left, and he chose to kick it to us rather than try to go for the first down and score and win the game. So Arrow got pinned with that, that moniker, going for the tie, but Duffy went for the tie. Yeah, and Duffy was on the 50-yard line. So it would have, wouldn't have been such of a risk if he had gone for it on fourth down. But he backed us up, you know, you know, we, we tried to throw him first down, and Coley got thrown for a loss. You know, then we just ran the clock out, and it was, it was a no-brainer. I mean, was, I don't know how Era ever got criticized for that, because if you ever really analyzed the game, you'd realize that that's the only thing you could do to preserve a national championship. That's what you were doing. Because we had one game left in Southern Cal, and we did okay. It was 51-0. <laughs> you know, so, so that worked. You guys were clearly the best team in the country that year, regardless of what anyone might have said. You, you beat number eight Purdue, you went, they went on to win the Rose Bowl, you shut out number 10 Oklahoma down in Norman, you just mentioned the big win over at USC to end the year. How good was that team? You guys gave up 38 points all season. And one of those was a block kick. So if you take out the block kick, our defense, they gave up an average of 2.3 yards per game. And as a quarterback, you go, whoa. 
you know, you're, you're basically getting the ball at the 50-yard line every time. And if you give Era any field position whatsoever, you're going for the home run. You might as well put your defensive backs right on the – put their heels on the goal line because that's where we're going to go with the ball. And, uh, I mean, Era was – and you got to look at the, the faith that he put in me and Jim – was, was incredible because here we were, our first game ever at Purdue, and, uh, and he just let us throw the ball all over the field. And, and we had a great r offensive line. We had a great running attack. And here was Era. He said, well, let's let these, see what these two little guys can do here. And we just went out and had some fun. And, you know, one of the things, too, the offense averaged 38 points a game. And I didn't play too many second halves because we were out at halftime. And that's how we used to mature some of the younger guys. They'd play in the second half, get some game experience. Instead of all this shuffling we see today, stick with the guys that are going to do it, get the guys in in the second half, you know, to get their experience and mature a little bit. But Yeah, we had four games that year where I not, did not play the second half. Yeah. So you're the second, third team, these guys, the, the experience you were gaining, the guys on the second team, because they're going to be first team next year. And if they have any kind of experience under the belt, you're going to be a much better football team, as opposed to what we've seen lately, where you know the second team doesn't even get a whiff because it's it's close the whole way. Terry, you mentioned your relationship with Jim Seymour that year. Notre Dame hadn't been a, a passing team much before that. Of course, you guys changed that, fling and cling out there. Talk about the chemistry and how you made that that relationship work and and that dynamic throughout the season. Well, Jim and I, are, I'm sure I see some old people here like me. So everybody re remembers the old field house yeah. before they've torn everything down. It was that dirt field there. Well, Jim and I used to go in there in the wintertime, and we'd throw the ball. I mean, we ran patterns. We ran hitch patterns. We ran slant patterns. We ran go patterns. And to run a go pattern, you had to throw it over two rafters <laughs> and drop, drop it in. You know, that's what we had to, had to do back in the day. But we just had that feel, you know, we really had a feel for each other because we worked so hard together. And that's what it takes. It takes a lot of hard work to, you know, to any kind of accomplishment in anything in life. And, George, you were the All-American center. We already talked a little bit about the passing game. The ground game averaged over 200 yards a, a game as well. What was it like blocking for an offense like that? Uh, it was pretty special. And we had some wonderful guys. Paul Seiler, God rest his soul, Tom Regner, myself, Dick Swatland at right guard. George Coons, and then he got hurt, Rudy Knitzner, and then Bob Kuchenberg. But it was wonderful. Um, and we had a great running back in Nick Eddy. But I tell you, I think the key to our running game was probably Larry Conjar. He was like having a six offensive lineman back there. He would take defensive ends down and knock them on their back. So that was pretty special about the running game. And then when you could run the football like that, like I've told Terry, he could have a smoke and a Coke back there. So that and opened up. That opened up the whole passing game because, you know, they, w when you set up a running game like that, the passing game becomes pretty simple. And, and everybody tries to really complicate the game of football. Yeah. And it really starts up front. Yeah. Forget about the quarterback. If this guy has five seconds to throw the ball, a lot of guys are going to complete the pass. But if he has no time to throw the ball, nobody's going to complete the pass. So in any, whether you're in high school, whether you're in college, whether you're in the pros, you look at the guys who have won all Super Bowls. They all have great offensive lines. Wow, isn't that a shock? Yeah. It's all the one constant. And that's the, the, the whole key. If you have that, then you have a defensive line who can put the pressure on the other quarterback. You have yourself a championship team. The guys really try to accomplish. They try to yeah. trick everybody. And just good, solid football wins games. And it's, it's, it's hard to believe that it, it's not it's – not, permeated throughout the football. Yeah, everybody tries to complicate it as time goes on. They try to get too cute. It's blocking and tackling, that simple. If you can block and tackle, you can do anything else you need to do. That first game, they didn't block or tackle anybody against Florida State. And right. you know, God bless them, I hope they go to school and figure that out. But the point is, if you can block and tackle, keep it simple, you're gonna win a lot of football games. I'll ask you guys about that, the matchup tomorrow with Purdue here in a little bit, but back to 66 for a second. It was Era's third year here at Notre Dame, his first of two national championships. What kind of coach was Era Parsegian to play for? Probably the best way to describe Era is that you can ask the All-American player 
or are you going to ask the guy on the team who never got in any game, and they all love Era. Era won. Era was faithful to everybody. Era never threw anybody under the bus. If we lost a game, which weren't many, he took blame for everything. And he, I can never, I'll never forget, uh -huh. I always remember these horrible games I played. Out here at the stadium against Southern Cal, I threw five picks. But Southern Cal gave me the game ball. <laughs> but, but that Monday at practice, you know, Aaron didn't say anything to me after the game. And I felt horrible and whatever, but it, it, that Monday at practice, you know, before we get started, he says, come here, I want to talk to you. We go about 20 yards over. He says, what do you think happened on Saturday? I said, Coach, sometimes there looks like there's two defensive backs back there. Sometimes there looks like there's 20. <clears throat> and he went, all right, get to work. Let's go. That's all he said. And we, went out, we, we start on the, the next winning streak. But Era was such a great motivator, and George knows better than I do because he was here when Era first got here. And everybody, they had great talent. But Pete Duranko was playing fullback. Yeah. Jim Snowden was playing halfback. And these guys were all pros in, in the offensive and defensive line in the NFL. So Era shifted everybody around. Nobody knew who John Hewitt was. Snow was second team. He put those two together. They're, he won the Heisman. This guy's first round pick by the Rams. Aaron knew his personnel, and he shifted people around and put them in spots where the key to any coaching is putting your players in a position where they can succeed. Think about that. And Aaron did that. He was a great personnel guy. There's no question about it. I was here in the spring my freshman year when Eric came on campus, and I always call it the magic carpet ride. That's when the ride started. Two and seven when I was a freshman with Hugh DeVore. Eric came on and took control of things. And I, I disagree a little bit with Terry. Um, he was a taskmaster. He busted our hump. And we worked hard. And I don't necessarily, I didn't love him so much, but I was going to listen to him. But after you see the success that came about because of his leadership and our hard work, that's when you start loving the guy. And that's when you're playing even harder for that. But one of the uh, two great things about Air was his uh, personnel decisions, where to put people to play. And the other one was his humility. He was a very humble guy, and he always strove to get better. He was an unbelievable motivational speaker. He was a great leader. He was a perfectionist. We were as well prepared as any team ever and at any level because of the in-depth study and in-depth uh, schemes that he had for us on both offense and defense. So all we had to do was follow his direction, and we were going to be successful. You talked a little bit earlier about the, the game against Michigan State there in 66. Uh, from the outside, that seems like that would be the biggest memory that either of you might have from, from Notre Dame. But what is your biggest memory from your four years here on campus? Well, that's hard, that's hard to tell. I mean, there were so many great ones that, uh, you know, the opening game against Purdue and, you know, I think going down to Norman, Oklahoma, wow. when we were ranked number two, I think, or one or two, I forget, and, Nor and uh, Oklahoma was, was ranked four, and they were just, they were, we were told to keep our helmets on on the sideline because they were throwing stuff from the stands at us. And in the fourth quarter when they looked up and saw 38 nothing up on the board, you could hear a pin drop. So that was one of the, what was one of the great, victories in, in our history, I think, because it, it was really very, very hostile. And you've never been in a situation like that before. Uh, the, the biggest thing I remember was the camaraderie. He had a wonderful knack to have people work together in his chemistry. We, we all were on the same page. We cared for each other. We were a bunch of schmucks that he whipped us into shape, and, and we ended up performing for him. But the, again, it was his preparation and uh, the camaraderie that he built. And it's so great being back here 55 years. God rest all our guys up in heaven that have passed on. And they were very special. You know, the Tom Regners, the Paul Seilers, the Pete Durankos, guys like that. Um, we had some talent, but, boy, Era did a fine job of fine-tuning us. And, again, it goes back to that humility that he had where he was striving to get better and making us better, too. And, you know, the other thing, too, was the continuity of the coaching staff. Johnny, old, deep, frog, froggy throat Ray, and then Pagna. Pagna used to say to these backfield guys, 
When you get in the end zone, act like you've been there before. You know, we don't need to celebrate. That's what we expect to do. So don't be, you know, goo goo gaga, all that stuff. Don't just hand the ball back to the ref and, and do that. So it was a combination of things, but the camaraderie and the chemistry that we had as players, I think, was pretty special, along with that chemistry that the coaches had. And that just, you know, trickled down into us players to make us a better team. And one thing that really sticks out is when, after our Purdue game, my sophomore year, first game of the year, you know, a big game, you're out there, we, we beat Purdue, Bob Greasy, I threw over 300 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, you know, feeling pretty good after the game. And I called my mother at home, and she said, I said, Mom, did you see the game? Did you see the game? She said, that Bob Greasy, what a gentleman he is. He came right <laughs> up to you after the game. You better, you're going to lose a game someday. You better be humble like he was. Oh, Mom. <laughs> they call Mrs. Greasy or Mrs. Hanratty. <laughs> but Sunday night, we, you know, when we had the, our meeting and we went over the, the, the game before, and I, you know, Jim and I come in pretty good. You know, we're, <clears throat> we didn't make any mistakes. Well, as soon as the lights went out and the film went on, Era and Tom Pagna were just berating the two of us for every little thing. We walked out of there thinking, did we even play Saturday? <laughs> but it told you, keep your head on your shoulders. You've got a lot of guys around you that deserve a lot of credit. Let's go. We're a team and stay together, and no one gets a big head around here. And you know Did you pay for that front seat? <laughs> <laughs> you can help. There you go. That's fair. You can help. You paid. You can help supplement our retirement if you'd like. <laughs> but you know, one other thing about that season too, uh, Purdue it was that, that was the opening game, I think it was. Yeah. So Leroy Keys intercepts the ball. It goes 98 yards for a touchdown, right? One of the first drives. The next play was an interception. It was a fumble. I'm sorry, fumble. Okay. <laughs> He's protecting his image. <laughs> so uh, it was a fumble, and uh, he returned at 98 yards for a touchdown. So we're down 7 nothing. to Purdue, the spoiler makers, right? They were always in our craw. Next play, Nick Eddy returns, returns the kickoff for a touchdown. So when you get an immediate response like that, you know, it's like, hey, we're back in this game. And by the way, I did get two blocks on that kickoff return. <laughs> you didn't get a block in the Michigan State game. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to might want to get that nose back on. <laughs> <laughs> want to leave some time for some audience questions here. So so really quickly, Terry, you went on, played six years in the NFL, have two Super Bowl eight rings. years, eight years. I'm sorry, my fault. Not not trying to short you. Two Super Bowl rings though, with your hometown Pittsburgh Steelers. How does a, a professional championship compare to a college football championship? Well, first of all, Bradshaw did most of the playing. <laughs> I did most of the playing here, but it. it it's a world of difference. College football and pro football are two different animals. You know, this is really, you're playing for your university. And, that, and the pros, it, you know, it's a business. You know, you, you did this for a living. Everybody had families. You had bills to pay and whatnot. In college, you had to go, you know, very difficult life. You had to go to class and play football. Wow, how tough is that? But, you know, so it, it was, you know, you knew that this was going to come to an end in a certain period. And for pros, you don't know when it's going to come to an end. But, you know, Father Time will tell you when it does. But it was a world of difference. I mean, it's a lot more fun in college than the pros. And, George, you played with the Broncos in the AFL before the merger. What was it like playing in the AFL as opposed to the NFL? Well, yeah, they thought we were stepchildren in the <laughs> AFL. You know, the NFL had their old cadre and and did what they were doing. I was involved in the mergers down in New Orleans when the associations merged. And a quick story, Mike Lucci was the player rep from the Detroit Lions, and he was belittling the AFL, oh, this stepchild league, this stepchild league, and all of that. So after um, Kansas City, it was, it was after uh, uh, Joe Willie beat, beat the Baltimore Colts. So he got off the bus, I says, Mike, welcome to the AFL. But, uh, one of the uh, interesting things, though, um, oh, yeah, it's, it's part of the First merger. thing that goes. See, I get, took too many head slaps, too many <laughs> head slaps. But, no, one of the great things about the AFL was Lamar Hunt tried to get an NFL franchise forever. He did everything he could. He petitioned the, uh, the, the owners and the management of the NFL. Couldn't get it three or four tries. He said, bag it. I'm going to start the AFL. And with the AFL, what that AFL did for players, for the black players especially, 
That was unbelievable how many guys had opportunities that the NFL weren't even thinking or talking about. All them uh, historically black colleges, the Buck Buchanans, Willie Lanier's, guys like that. They, he gave them an opportunity and expanded the opportunity in pro football and then coaching also. John Madden always said, you know, he may not have coached if the AF had, hadn't come about because of Lamar Hunt. So he deserves all the kudos for starting the AFL and being as vigilant as he was. He had a couple of bucks, too. That didn't hurt. But to be as vigilant as he was to continue to, you know, expand the football horizons. Great. We've got time for a couple of questions from the audience. If anyone wants to raise their hand, Joanne will come around with a microphone. Any questions? Right up here we have a couple. Joanne. Again, Raddy, here's a fellow grad, class of 69. I, I just wanted to tell you another reason why you won that 10 10 tie. My dad, New York City policeman, big time subway alum, couldn't believe I was dating a guy from Notre Dame. And my sister right here, who's with me, we were watching the game, screaming, yelling, jumping up and down. We broke our couch. <laughs> That's how good of a game it was. You had a couch growing up? <laughs> Uh, Terry, hi. Jim Slattery here. Uh, I thought it was interesting the comment you made when you were at Notre Dame, and myself included, we, um, we went through the basketball games, of course you were at the football games, but when your son went to Notre Dame, what, what happened? He wasn't able to do all the things we did. It's a, it's a, it's working? Hello. You got, it's, it's a world difference now. It really is, and it's not to the better. You know, when we were here, some of our best friends, first of all, were the students in the dorms. We had we could actually associate with them because we had time to socialize with them. And we always went to all the basketball games you know, with Bob Whitmore and Carlos Jones and all these guys. They were our, all our dear friends. We used to go and root for them. They'd come root for us. And, but then when my son Connor was here, I said, what, did you see that basketball game? He said, Dad. He said, we have practice and meetings till 7 o'clock at night. I got two hours of homework. How can I go to a basketball game? And I'm saying, you know, there's too much emphasis on it. You know, if everybody was, you know, not one person could draw back the emphasis. That the whole NCAA has got to pull back the emphasis and let these kids have a life. I mean, they are going, they, they go to the Goog at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, have their morning practice. Then they go to class, then they come to the Goog and, and they have their afternoon practices and meetings. And by the time that's over at 7 o'clock at night, they have two hours of homework. And that's not college life. It, it's, sad to, it's sad to say, but we had fun. And, you know... And everybody said, well, do you feel bad you didn't have any bowl games when you were there? I said, no. I said, I got to go home for Christmas. You know, these kids never, these kids don't have any vacation. They go right from, from this practice down to practice in Florida. Then, you know, then, then it's February. They got to come back to school after the bowl game is over. You know, so there's no, there's no camaraderie anymore. It's, it's tough to get associated with, you know. And I used to tell him, I said, don't just go out with your buddies from the team. Go out with the guys in the dorm. They're going to be around all your life. And my son would try to jab me. He called me, hey, Dad, I went, to, went out to dinner last night with two, two guys that don't play football. I said, all right, that's good. That's a start. Keep it going. You know, and they, it started out where more is better. You know, back in the day, Terry had told me that he wouldn't see Connor but two weeks of, a year. Yeah. And, you know, we'd get home for the uh, Christmas, like he said. We'd be home all summer, which was, which was special. But, again, more is not always better. You know, it's how well you do when you're at and practicing and learning your skills as a football player. So everybody got on that train about lifting weights and all the dietitians and all that stuff. And I, I guess a lot of times maybe it helps to be, become better physically. But one of the things that a lot of people don't understand, football is a mental game. And if you're tougher between the ears and in your heart and your soul, and you want to block someone or you want to tackle someone or you want to complete a pass, that's up to you as an individual. Your body's not going to do it. It's going to help because you're, God gave you a, a, a talent and God gave you the body to do that. But the distinction is between the ears and the heart and the soul. And, and that's what, you know, good football players come out of is that whole discipline and that, you know, repetition and that, in that way and that uh, method. So. All right, time for one more question here from the audience. Dave Bertrand, class of 1962. So I'm old. Whoop, 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 whoop. I had Joe Kuharik, gentlemen, remember that. 
Oh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I'm back here all the time. I like winds. But anyhow, what do you guys think of letting all these young people make some money? And what really triggered me, we have a kid in New Jersey who left high school last Saturday, finished high school, he joined Rutgers on Sunday, went to practice on Monday, and he's signing contracts. The guy hasn't played a game at all. And personally, I think you're going to have nothing but problems when the star, the quarterback, you know, typically, are making so much money and the guys in the trenches are getting shafted. Any well, thoughts? That's the whole key. I mean, who's going to, you know, I love my linemen. My son was a lineman. I love George, and my linemen protected me for many years. But it's going to be the quarterback making the money. And how does he make this money? The linemen go, you know, after – four or five games, they'll realize they have no money in their pocket, but the quarterback's pockets are full. You know, how do we share this thing? What scares me is, you know, I don't think they're going to make a lot of it. I think it's going to be a splash to begin with. But what scares me is eventually someone's going to go down the line. It's going to end up where the universities are going to pay the athletes. Then the next step is going to be they're going to say, well, you know, if we're paying you, we can't afford your scholarship. So then, then there, people don't realize that less than 1% go to the pros, and, and about 10% of the guys who go in the pros make all the money. So it, it's a really a big gamble to take not to get an education. Well, well you know, one of the things that, that happened, too, is that uh, the quarterback from Alabama, before he even started a game, had a million-dollar contract for name, image, and likeness, okay? If I'm a quarterback, I'm, I'm dispensing some of those dollars to my offensive linemen. You know what I mean? Spread it around a little bit. And there's ways to manage that, but after a while, if, if Henry's making a million, I ain't getting squat. I'm going to take tickets and let, you know, <laughs> let Granville Liggins knock his jock in the dirt, you know? All right. Terry, George, thank you both so much for being here today. Everybody, help me thank you these two. Thank you. Go thank on. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Congratulations on your 55 yeah. years. Thank you very much, Chris.